Yachts Air. Welcome to Little Chase. Tomorrow, November 8th, is Election Day. Recently, we had the honor and privilege to interview both the Navajo Nation presidential candidates. This video is the interview with President Jonathan Nez. You might notice that the quality is a little bit different. Uh, it's not as good, to be frank, um, as the interview we did with the other candidates. And I want to make it clear that is not an endorsement for either candidate. Um, it was just a change of plans. Uh, originally, we had both interviews scheduled to be under the same conditions at the same location. Um, but we did the best that we could with uh, what we had. And so with that said, I hope that you find this interview informative and that it gives you a sense of optimism and faith in both of the candidates. Um, but if not, at least find it inform informative. Uh, share this with your friends and family. Like, comment, subscribe, and let's get started. All right, Jonathan Nez, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, last name Nez, N-E-Z, Navajo Nation President. Fantastic. <clears throat> so, um, Mr. President, one of, to me, one of the biggest accomplishments you've made over the past four years is the uh, Utah Water Rights Settlement. And I think a lot of people who were impacted know how fundamental and monumental that change was, but the people who don't live in those areas, I, I don't think maybe have as much of an understanding. So can you explain why that was so important? Well, just like uh, all the water rights, Indian water rights settlements that's happening, happening throughout the country, you know, we are fighting for our fair share of water. When the Winters Doctrine or any other uh, agreement was put in place, many indigenous peoples, tribes weren't at the table. And so because of the uh, Winter's Doctrine, we were able to uh, make sure that uh, tribes uh, are a part of these agreements. And, you know, with the uh, Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project with the San Juan River, we, when I was a delegate, we approved that agreement that will bring water from the um, San Juan River close to Shiprock to Gallup, and as you know today, you, if you drive through that area, pipelines are being laid uh, right alongside 491. We also got a uh, water line developed from the Cutter Dam, the Cutter Lateral, that puts uh, uh, water into the communities like Nyeezy, as far as Ojo Encino and Torreon. And so I bring that out because that set the momentum for the Navajo Utah Gallup Water Rights Settlement. Uh, we made sure that the next major water line settlement would be for the communities of, that are within the Utah Navajo portion, those eight communities. And we, it was um, a collaborative effort with the state legislature of Utah, over $200 million of funding went to this project. We got that uh, agreement put in place. We signed it with the, the governor, uh, Spencer Cox of Utah. And now we're awaiting the contracts to be uh, bidded upon so that we can get these water projects to these communities. And I know communities like Navajo Mound are looking forward to getting water within their communities, drinking water, as well as uh, the Old Jato, the Goulding's area, because many, no, many people know that there's uh, uranium contamination in the water, uh, high arsenic levels in the water, and so using the surface water, the water rights settlement will give clean drinking water to those communities in Utah. So, so you're saying, um, just to be uh, clear, there's the contamination of uranium and arsenic in the groundwater, right? in some places in some locations. because we've been drilling to test those uh, areas so especially where there's uh, much 
uh, uranium mines that are in the area, especially in that uh, Oljato, uh, Monument Valley area, as well as Cameron area. We've done some sampling, which did reveal that there is uh, uranium in the water table, as well as uh, heavy metals, including arsenic. So I, I want to touch on the uranium in a little bit, but continuing with water, there's 30 to 40% of people on the Navajo Nation who don't have <coughs> access to running water. Would you say it's primarily because of the settlements or um, a lack of infrastructure? What, what are the main reasons for that? Well, I think it's the bureaucracy and the red tape, as you know, Antonio, there's so many, so much federal regulations that hinder development in communities. And we have to deal with the Department of Interior. Uh, we have to deal with uh, the US EPA when it comes to uh, Clean Water Act and transportation. So there's multiple federal agencies that oversee trust land, Indian lands throughout the country. And so in order for us to do uh, development, we have to go through these hurdles in order for progress to happen. But we have had some success in this new administration, the Biden-Harris administration, where there is some streamlining happening on uh, policies and regulation updates. Matter of fact, in the um, infrastructure bill, we lobbied heavily so that we could be able to use existing right-of-way to put fiber uh, cables throughout the Navajo Nation. And you see that happening all across uh, uh, our nation. Uh, those little orange, red uh, plastic uh, markers that are going up, that's fiber being laid all over the Navajo Nation. The major trunk lines, and then once we get the major trunk lines, then we'll branch them off into the various homes on the Navajo Nation. So this is one example of what our administration has done to streamline the process, but it's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, and uh, we're working on uh, making sure it, it gets changed or updated with the federal agencies. So um, speaking on fiber, I think some people, of course, know that, but also some people aren't too familiar what you're speaking about in particular. Can you elaborate? Well, fiber is the cables that are going up all over the Navajo Nation to provide high-speed internet. Uh, and public safety communication. There's uh, multiple strands of fiber that are being, that are in one line. And two of those are dedicated for our public safety uh, officials so that they can get the calls, get to a place uh, quickly uh, so that they can respond to, you know, uh, emergencies. But overall, what we wanna do is just to get high speed internet uh, to our, our Navajo home. So when we talk about fiber, you know, most of the time we're talking about high speed, major high speed internet uh, to go to the homes. So you mentioned creating the, um, a division of youth and elders by pulling programs out of DOH, Department of Health and the um, Department of Education. Can you explain where that idea came from and um, what are some next steps? Well, that idea came from the previous administration and it came from me as the vice president at the time. I tried to pitch that to that uh, administration at that time, but you know, certain things happened. Uh, we, have, we went through a pandemic, this uh, administration, which took up a lot of uh, the four years. But what we're wanting to do is not just put the youth program uh, and the elder program, the aging program together, but also other programs of the Navajo Nation to create a new division with our own division director. Because right now, the office of Diné Youth is within uh, the Department of Diné Education, almost at the bottom of the uh, hierarchy. And then you got the aging program under the Department of Health. So when it comes to annual budgets, sometimes these two programs don't have the priority. If we elevate it to a division level, when the budget comes, they will get uh, the, one of the largest shares of the pot because the monies would go to our, our youth and elders. And that was the vision that we've had and we're gonna do that uh, this coming uh, uh, term if uh, God gives us the ability to serve another four years.
So that, those relationships, can you speak more about why that's important, having that intergenerational connection? Right, right, you know, right now, l let me step back a bit. You know, we, we went through a pandemic. Uh, we told our people to stay home. But we also challenge families to not just be scared of the virus, but also to teach our ways uh, at the home, having our elders teach our young people. Since everybody was home, nobody's working, schools were closed, we challenge our Navajo people. Let's teach our way of life to our younger generation. And many uh, of our Navajo people took on that challenge. And we even said, talk to your children, grandchildren in Navajo. So that happened throughout the pandemic and so you see a renaissance of Navajo people learning their way of life, uh, the teachings, and also uh, knowing their, their own language. So it's very important that we continue that intergenerational uh, concept of bringing our young people and our elders together because that's going to be, I truly believe, uh, the way we can con can. Uh, encourage our young people to learn their ways and of course learn their language, relearn their language. Um, so I'm curious, uh, do you have a position on, on alcohol, on legalizing alcohol and taxing it and using that sales tax for, uh, for treatment facilities? Well, you know, that's a, a question for the Navajo people to, to agree upon, you know. Is it time for the Navajo Nation to make alcohol legal. You know, we already have alcohol legal, legal in, at the casino areas. And, and so there has been recommendations by our uh, public health uh, professionals to tax that. And not just that, but also uh, maybe looking at hemp production, uh, medicinal marijuana usage, and recreational marijuana. It's all around us right now, the Navajo Nation. I mean, it, it's approved in Arizona, in New Mexico, Colorado. And so what do we do now since people do get the substances from off the Navajo Nation? And so that's a question that uh, I think really should be posed to the Navajo people. Are we ready for that? And maybe a referendum to see that. And yeah, that could bring in resources to uh, mental and behavioral health services uh, rehabilitation centers. Matter of fact, we have uh, two um, behavioral health uh, facilities, rehab centers that we're wanting to build, which was allocated through the American Rescue Plan Act funding that we just recently received. Recently received. So, you know, our our, do, our people do uh, are wanting help with substance abuse. So, you know, those are things that uh, the Navajo people are going to have to to discuss into the future. You know? So um, in terms of uranium mining um, and the legacy that's left on Navajo, um, I, I really appreciate your stance on trying to um, reauthorize and expand RECA, RECA. Uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Um, I, I think I might have mentioned it before, but my great-grandfather uh, was a uranium miner who oh, died okay. Sorry. from lung cancer. Sorry to hear that. No. And uh, <laughs> my family was actually fortunate enough to get the funding from okay. um, Rika way back when, mm -hmm. but I know there's a lot of people who right. were left out. Um, but with that said, do you have any strategies on closing or uh, remediating the abandoned uranium mines? I believe there's over 500, 500 throughout the Navajo Nation. Well, uh, about 200 of those have been settled and there is over a uh, billion dollars to uh, clean some of those uranium mines up. But the question always comes is, where is this uranium waste going to go? If we don't want it on Navajo, it's got to go somewhere. Does it go to New Mexico, southern New Mexico? Does it go to the White uh, Mesa Mill up in, up in Utah? Or do we just cap these uh, uranium mines? If we cap them, then they're still there. Uh, and you know uranium, uh, uranium is live. Uh, for, for many decades, uh, many centuries. So that's always a challenge because just, just look at what happened with the monsoon weather this, this past uh, summer. Some of those uh, uranium mines that were capped, they're starting to erode. 
and we don't want that erosion uh, to have the water table get contaminated with uranium. And so what do we do? Uh, one of the propositions was to purchase land uh, somewhere uh, and to get all that uranium waste into that area. But of course, the federal government have to, has to approve the, the uh, place where it's gonna be uh, buried, and that takes uh, a lengthy time. So right now, we met with the US, e, US EPA Administrator, Michael Regan, uh, on uh, remediating some of those uh, uh, uranium mines that were capped. Uh, some of them were in Cameron. Of course, there's Cameron, uh, Oljato, Monument Valley, as I mentioned, all the way into uh, New Mexico. And so there's just one uh, uranium mine to be cleaned up takes five to ten million dollars. You do the math, you know, 500 open uranium mines is going to be costly to the American people. And so even the United States of America doesn't want to uh, acknowledge their wrongdoing because there's never been an apology for what uh, the federal government has done in digging up uranium on tribal lands. But back to your question about the open uranium mine and what we're going to do. We had the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, first time ever, come to the Navajo Nation to talk about what we all need to do to strategize on getting rid of the uh, uranium. Uh, people who live by a uranium mine will say they don't want it. We don't want it in our backyard, and where do we take it? That's, that's one of the biggest questions, because 500 uranium mines is a lot of uranium waste, and where would it go? Uh, so we're hoping that in the future there's going to be better technology. I mean, there's even uh, a pilot project going right now to where um, some of the uranium mines in the United States, the way they're being remediated is they're planting hemp on top of it. Apparently the hemp, uh, the roots in there suck out a lot of the uranium out of the, uh, out of the ground and then they chop it down and all that waste is within the plant but that's still in the preliminary stages so that might be something to to look into in the future for Navajo but of course we're hopeful that there'll be uh, better technology in the future to address the the waste and the cleanup of these 500 over 500 uranium mines on Navajo. So you mentioned that you brought the head of the EPA Michael Re Reagan on a tour of abandoned uranium mines and uh, when he found out that he was standing on a uranium mine he freaked out. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that and if you felt like you've had more of a response from the EPA since that tour? Well you know we invite our federal partners and federal leaders to come out to Navajo and to see firsthand what our Navajo people go through. So when we brought uh, the US EPA administrator uh, to the Cameron area, it was also with uh, Congressman Tom O'Halloran. And we told him there's a uranium mine close by and we took him out there. There was no fence, right? We don't have fences. We don't have uh, signs everywhere that's saying there's a uranium mine. So we took him adjacent to one of them within you know, yards of where the cap was and he was surprised that he was uh, that close and I said you know within a hundred uh, feet away there was a house there where people live and I said you know what that's what our people have to go through every single day and then within a quarter of a mile there was the Cameron community uh, hundreds of homes and I just let him know that if you're surprised then just imagine what our Navajo people go through on a daily basis uh, living close nearby to these uh, uranium mines, even though they're capped. We were up there not too long ago with um, uh, with the, uh, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee as well, which uh, Representative Tom O'Halloran brought out to Cameron area. And when we went on top of some of these uh, ridges, was the, our own Navajo Nation EPA was carrying a, a counter and they was going off like crazy and they were telling us uh, you shouldn't go there. And I was like, turned around, I said, you know what? 
kids play here. Oh, why, why don't we fence this off and why don't we uh, let people know the dangers uh, of, of being here, especially when the counter goes off uh, showing that it's high levels of uranium in the area. So all it is is just educating our, our leaders, uh, our Congress, uh, men and women. Uh, but I think the tide is changing a bit, Antonio, uh, because of the new administration. The Biden-Harris administration uh, has had an open door uh, for the Navajo Nation. You know, I've been there, met the president of the United States many times, and um, he's always uh, receptive for us uh, to have a dialogue with him on what are the issues pertaining not just to Navajo, but all of Indian country. And I think we're leading the way. I mean, we changed some regulations that benefited Navajo, but in reality, it benefited all the tribes too, because when you change a, a policy or regulation dealing with Navajo, it tends to also help all 500 uh, Native American tribal nations throughout the country. So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was a significant part of your presidency so far. Um, during the height of the pandemic, what were some of the hardest decisions that you had to make? Uh, that's a good question, Antonio. I mean, uh, there was uh, a lot of decisions that there was no playbook for, right? Uh, there was no uh, recommendations or something to go by. So a lot of it was relying on our public health experts, our frontline uh, warriors that were out on a daily basis, giving us guidance of what to do. and. One of the things that we've done to secure and keep our people safe was to lock down the nation. And we took our sovereign ability seriously on the Navajo Nation. We have the ability to govern ourselves and we said, okay, nobody's coming into the Navajo Nation. And one of the hardest decisions was to let, to tell our, our, our Navajo, especially those that were living in Phoenix, to not come home. Because it's their homeland, it's their families but we wanted to keep our elders safe. And that was one of the toughest decisions. And I think uh, our Navajo people that were living off the Navajo Nation recognized and understood that uh, we needed to do that. And it was because of that, uh, those tough protocols we were able to uh, keep uh, the, the virus uh, from just exploding uh, on the Navajo Nation. And plus when the vaccine rollout happened. <clears throat> we got the vaccines the same day as the rest of the country. And that was unprecedented because uh, we advocated that we are to have the um, vaccines quickly. And the rollout, as you may know, was swift. People in long lines, you would think <clears throat> because of the relationship and the history that we have with the federal government, that people wouldn't trust uh, the vaccine. but. You know, we as leaders reassured the Navajo people that it was safe to, to take the vaccine. And because of that, today, our elders, 65 and over, 90% fully vaccinated. And I think, I truly believe it's because of the efforts of the Navajo people, them accepting the, the vaccines that we were able to turn it around. And now we've seen some very low case counts on the Navajo Nation COVID. But of course, we're, we're keeping the restrictions in place because there's a new virus, the monkeypox, four uh, verified cases on the Navajo Nation. And so we're not ready to lift any of those uh, mask mandates or uh, some of those protocols that we have uh, in gathering. So thinking about the, um, the election season, a lot of people are coming at it as if uh, they're asking, what is the president going to do for me? And uh, I think when we ask that question, we, we tend to miss a lot, if that's the only question we're asking. Um, so my question is, what are some things that we can do for the president? And what are some things that we can do to get engaged to help our community and to make a difference? No, that's a good question. I think the, the first thing that, that I would ask for is prayer. prayer praying for our president, our, our leaders in the council, our local leaders because it was because of prayer that got us out of the pandemic. I truly believe that. You know, people were reverent at home. They had to stay home. You know, I used the same philosophy in Navajo 
If you ever heard the philosophy when there was a, a rain, a storm coming, our parents used to tell us to get inside and to, to not talk, just to sit still and stay reverent and to pray. So that same philosophy we use at a Navajo nation, nation level to where when the storm of COVID was coming, we told everybody to stay home because we know that the safest place to be is at home and to pray. And a lot of those prayers uh, were answered because we were able to turn it around. And we have a, Navajo Nation now has a testimony because people say, how did you guys do at Navajo? And all I say is the Navajo people honored their leaders, honored their public health professionals, their frontline workers. And because of that, we were able to turn it around. It wasn't about individual uh, thinking, like outside, you know. You had people protesting in the streets, in the state legislatures, about how they were denied their freedoms because they were being forced to wear masks, or they were told to stay at home uh, against their, their, their individual freedom. But on, in Navajo or in Indian country, we didn't think about ourselves. We thought about our families, we thought about our community, we, brought, we thought about our nation because we wanted to keep everybody safe. And so I think really overall, the Navajo people did an outstanding job in pushing back on COVID. And now you see, uh, you know, the, the success rate on Navajo and we're getting uh, close to fully reopening. But again, this new virus monkeypox is kind of uh, hindering totally reopening on the Navajo Nation. But we just want to keep safe. And as you, as you know, Antonio, you, especially down here in Phoenix, I bet you, you you can tell who the Navajos are, right? Because they'll be wearing their masks. And because again, they think uh, and they believe that wearing a mask uh, will keep everybody safe at home. Yeah. So in terms of climate change, um, are there any actions that you are trying to take um, with, uh, with your next, uh, if you're reelected with your next presidency? Right. Well, I, I want to emphasize that in the new federal law that was passed, the Inflation Reduction Act, there's funding in there for uh, climate resiliency, drought resiliency. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we're, we're talking about and we're developing a plan is, okay, we had forest fires that occurred in, in Flagstaff and in Santa Fe all around us. And as you know, a couple of years ago, we had a fire in Sawmill, uh, and it's getting closer to the Navajo Nation. So we really need to look at our, uh, the health of our forests. And so I think one of the things that we can use uh, is the funding to thin out some of our forests on Navajo, up in the Chuska, the Kajigay Mountains, and also in the Sawmill area, to thin out the forests and to, you can see the bark beetles eating away on our trees. If you see the trees, they're turning yellow and so we need to cut those trees down and make sure that the bark beetles don't expand so in order to do that you have to get rid of some of those uh, trees and one, one of the things is you can treat it you can saw them up and you can give them to our elders or those that are in need of firewood at the same time uh, thinning out our forests the other thing too in the inflation reduction act back to your question about climate change is we need to begin to uh, rebuild our earthen dams. Uh, this year was a, a, a lot of rain. The monsoon was uh, more than expected. So a lot of those earthen dams that were rebuilt ha breached because it overflowed. But I think with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act funding, we can use those dollars to make permanent changes on some of these earthen dams so that they can be done with concrete. So where it overflows, it doesn't cut into, into the ground or into the uh, soil so that that water can stay here on Navajo rather than you know, going into the tributaries and sometimes we lose out on that water right. So thinking, continuing with climate change um, and trying to decarbonize, um, are there any strategies you have in terms of um, trying to decarbonize the sectors of generating electricity or transportation or food and agriculture? Right. 
Well, right now, as you know, the Navajo Nation is a 100% owner of two solar plants in Kayenta. We are in the process of building another solar uh, plant in uh, Red Mesa. There's over close to 200 jobs, Navajo jobs, uh, that were made um, because of the uh, construction of that plant. And we got other projects in Tlachi, Cameron, uh, in New Mexico as well. I really truly believe that th through our Hayos Kalt proclamation, our Sunrise proclamation, we have an opportunity in Navajo. We're set right in the middle of the Southwest where the demand is high for renewable energy. We just got a, an agreement with the city of LA. They want to purchase uh, a certain amount of megawatts that is generated clean energy that is generated on the Navajo Nation. So we have the opportunity. I know people say there's not a, not, not a lot of jobs in renewable energy, but the money, the revenue that can be created is selling that renewable energy. It'll bring millions of dollars into the Navajo Nation. And if we use correctly that money, that can also create jobs and economic opportunities for the Navajo people. So thinking about what's happening around um, the nation, there's some moves. General Motors, uh, for example, made a decision to stop producing um, combustible engine vehicles uh, by 2030. And there's some other car manufacturing companies that are doing that. Um, and there seems like there's this economic shift towards um, electric vehicles. California banned uh, the sale of new electric vehicles by 2030. Um, with that said, there needs to be that vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, is that something that we need to be thinking about in Navajo or is that something that Absolutely. shouldn't be a priority? Absolutely, Antonio. I think we need to embrace that change because if you have more uh, electric cars traveling throughout the country, then you need to have these charging stations strategically located on the Navajo Nation. For instance, we're looking at uh, having a charging station in our small community of Chantel, Arizona. There's a hotel being built, there's a convenience store gas station, and right now there's not one charging station on the Navajo Nation. There's one in uh, Winslow, there's one in Holbrook, but not on the Navajo Nation. So if we wanna say to our visitors, come in, uh, enjoy and experience the Navajo people, then we also need to make sure that their vehicles uh, can traverse through our Navajo Nation. Can you give a shout out to a Navajo Nation employee who is uh, under-recognized but embodies that sense of uh, public servants? You know, I, I think Everyone throughout the uh, Navajo Nation throughout this pandemic did an outstanding job. I know people come up to me when I travel or I'm in DC, even the President of the United States would say to me, how did you guys do it, President? How did you do it? How did you? I was like, you know, I didn't do it. It was the Navajo people who persevered, who did an outstanding job listening to these protocols. And I think every single person on the Navajo Nation, they're the ones that done an outstanding job to turn the tide. I know you're probably wanting me to say a name of one person, but I think really our frontline warriors, many of them who caught the virus, uh, I was proud and honored to uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with our warriors and our lady warriors throughout the pandemic. And they need to be commended. I know that uh, they have a heart for the Navajo people, and, uh, and I was just so honored, and I'm honored to be their president. Uh, and speaking about legacy, um, what, what legacy do you want to leave behind after you leave the president, presidency? Well, the reason why I got into politics in the first place is hearing the legacy of my grandfather, H.T. Donald. I was uh, one years old when he went back with the Lord. And I know my mom said that he, he held me when I was a baby. But as I was growing up uh, there in the area, uh, Shanto and Kienta, as you know, 
we see our clans and then we see our parents and we see our grandparents thing. When I always get to my grandfather's name, people would say, your grandfather helped me in this way. Your, your grandfather supported me in this way. And just listening to that, you know, it really encouraged me to get into public service because I thought that was something uh, that uh, would be um, remembered, uh, not just by the people, but my own family too, because we are a family that has helped uh, in, in difficult times or for other families that are uh, struggling. And so, you know, legacy, uh, you know, just being remembered as a, as a humble person that was uh, God-fearing and that uh, helped his people. And there was no, uh, again, no playbook on how to get through the pandemic, but I think we did, we did a great job. Well, thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, yeah, that's enough. All right. Thank you. All right. You're a tough reporter. Yeah. <laughs>